Hello. Today we're going to look at a very mournful, melancholic poem called A Complaint by William Wordsworth. And I reckon the narrator's complaint is one that we can all sympathise with and relate to. Do you want to know the worst complaint I ever heard? It was in a rap song. Now I'm not much of a lad for rap. I can appreciate that these lads can craft engaging lyrics and they make stacks of money and good luck to them. It's not really my cup of tea. But when I was a boy there was a rapper, a big chunky lad, I think his name was Notorious D.I.V. or something. Anyway, this guy's complaint, I heard it on the radio once, my jaw sagged open in disbelief. This guy's complaint was more money, more problems. The more money you get, the more problems you see. And you think, well, cry me a river. You've got to be kidding me, pal. You poor little sausage. You want to cure that complaint? Write me a cheque right now. I'll take all that nasty money away from you. William Wordsworth's complaint, however, is slightly more legitimate. And here's a brief overview of the poem before we launch into the analysis of language and structure. Over three stanzas and with a very fixed rhyme scheme, the poem relates the narrator's regret over the cooling of a friendship or relationship, where once there had been this deep, powerful bond between them, now his friend is less demonstrative in showing his affection. And this deeply saddens the narrator. What I'll do now, for your educational advancement, is I'm going to dip into the poem and pull out a couple of features of language and structure, analyse them, and maybe try and marry them up with some contextual factors as well, because I know exam boards increasingly ask students to look at the era when a poem was written, details from the writer's life, and apply relevant details to their analysis of the text. We'll kick off with an exploration, a deconstruction of metaphor. In this case, the following line. Your love hath been a fountain at my fond heart's door. He mentions this in stanza one when he's talking about the, the close bond that used to exist between them. And I think it's a very expressive metaphor because a fountain, as you know, projects water with some force. So I think it's a great way of conveying the, uh, the original intensity that characterised the love, the intimacy, the friendship between these two people. And speaking purely personally, it's a metaphor that conjures up an image of one of those water cannons you know, that riot police use to disperse drunken football hooligans. You get a big burst of water, hammers into these idiots. I dare say it sobers them up pretty damn quickly. Getting back on track, though, we can apply a relevant contextual link to this line about the fountains. Because historically, traditionally, a fountain would have been an index or measure or reflection of wealth. Before cities had mains water, it would have been incredibly expensive to build a fountain that pumped water outwards or upwards. And this contextual factor adds another layer of meaning to that metaphor of the fountain because we can perceive the fountain image as suggesting that the friendship enriched the narrator's life. If you needed great wealth to build a fountain, I'm taking that idea of wealth metaphorically, I'm saying it enriched, it added to the spiritual wealth of the narrator, his happiness. In stanza two, Wordsworth lays on some religious imagery. There's a line, blessed was I, then all bliss above, blah, 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 consecrated fount. And what's the effect of this religious imagery? Uh, the idea of blessed and consecrated. These are words drawn from Christian religion. Well, I would say that it helps convey the idea that the friend's love was a source of great spiritual comfort to the narrator. People have religion in their lives. It gives them guidance. It's like a, a crutch in hard times. Similarly, it suggests this friendship supported the narrator, gave him spiritual guidance, spiritual sustenance in hard times. And notice the plosive alliteration in this line. Plosive, scary word, basically means spitting word, spitting sounds like b. And blessed and bliss help to capture the, the passionate, warm feeling that the narrator had for his friend. Looking at the alliteration there, is uh, purely a secondary interpretation. Examiners love it if you can, once you've analysed a quote, delve back into the quote and maybe pull out a secondary interpretation. Go, oh, there's this technique as well, and this technique does, and that's just what I've done here with the alliteration, the plosive alliteration. On the structural techniques now, you'll notice that stanza three has a couple of dashes. Have a goggle at the line at the bottom of the screen. A well of love, it may be deep, I trust it is, and never dry. Now on to the effect of this structural technique, the dashes. 
I would argue that the frequency of dashes in stanza three helps to capture the narrator's increasing anxiety as he contemplates a life without this intense friendship to sustain him. Strong emotion, of course, be that sadness or anger or whatever, can disturb the flow of your words. And purely in the spirit of a secondary interpretation, I've said at the bottom as well, also perhaps it reflects the idea of his own life being disturbed or disrupted by the loss of this friend. On a rhyme scheme next, our rhyme scheme. If I had a pound for every time some clown on the internet or in a revision booklet says something like, and this poem has an ABAB rhyme scheme, and then jogs on to another detail, and I'm left there screaming at the screen, that's great you divvy, I've got a seven-year-old daughter can work out a rhyme scheme. What I need from you, what my students need from you, is some consideration of effect. Why has the writer used this rhyme scheme? People seem very reluctant to address that issue. I will not be so blasé. This poem employs a fixed or regular A-B-A-B-C-C -C rhyme scheme. And on the next slide, we'll consider why this is so. And here is an explanation of that rhyme scheme, giving two interpretations as is my way. First, I'd say that this fixed rhyme scheme, it captures the idea of the narrator's grief being inescapable, like it's, it's kind of certain. And perhaps the poem's cyclic structure, I think some of the phrasing in the first and last stanza are very similar, that cyclic structure adds credence or supports that idea. Now, the second interpretation, which I prefer more, frankly, is that by imposing this fixed rhyme scheme on the poem, the narrator is trying to control his grief. If you think about it, rhyme contains or controls language. It echoes or mirrors or parallels the narrator striving to control his grief. And of course, he's not entirely successful in that, is he? Because you've got those dashes highlighting that anxiety that's kind of creeping through. Onto context again now, though, because it's believed that Wordsworth wrote this poem in response to issues in his own life in 1807. Now, one of the most celebrated bromances in the history of English literature is between William Wordsworth, the writer of this poem, and another poet called Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And during the late 18th century, early 19th century, these guys would bond. They'd go on long walks in the Lake District together. I don't know if you know the Lake District. It's beautiful. Uh, it makes paradise look like a bombed-out slum. It's stunning. It's God's own country. And they'd walk for miles, for days even, discussing life, love, poetry and politics. They even collaborated on a collection of poems together. Why have they drawn William Wordsworth as a horse? Well, a lot of snarky folks say he resembled a horse. He had a very long face. I'm not very good, as you can see, at drawing horses. I figured I could do the practice. Now, Coleridge was a bit of a wild man, really. I mean, this is a guy that arguably founded recreational rock climbing in England. And he didn't use anything as advanced as ropes and helmets. Lord, no. He used to rely on blind faith sometimes, and just drop and hope that it didn't shatter his spine. And this risk-taking extended to his use of recreational drugs. He was an opium addict, and he had to travel abroad to Malta, I think, uh, to, to recover and detox. But as I'm sure you know, drugs can have a horrific impact on both body and soul. And when he came back to his mate, he came back to Wordsworth, Wordsworth noticed that Coleridge's mental and physical state had deteriorated significantly and there was no longer that bond, that love, that intense friendship between them. Okay, I've made with the yakety yak yak long enough now I think. We've looked at language and structure and context. Let's start weaving some of this stuff together now into exemplary exam paragraphs. Have a read of this one. In a complaint, Wordsworth employs punctuation to present the narrator's feelings towards his friend. He writes, a well of love, it may be deep, I trust it is, never dry. The dashes here powerfully convey the distress and anxiety the reader feels at the deterioration of the friendship. The poem echoes Wordsworth's own concerns regarding his strained relationship with Coleridge. This strain was due to Coleridge's altered character on returning from abroad after struggles with addiction. We'll do a quick deconstruction now, a quick analysis of why this paragraph is deserving of the highest marks. Well, first of all, I'm citing the structural technique in my point, in my first line. I'm talking about the punctuation. And I'm assuming the question was something like, how does this poem present feelings? So I've used a key word from the question as well. It keeps, the, keeps my content 
relevant to the question. I've got my quote there, and then I say the dashes, because of course that's the structural technique, the dashes here powerfully convey to the reader. I think in the previous paragraph you saw, I didn't have the term the reader in. The reason I've added it, because I know some examples are very finickety and fussy. You have to say that the effect is on the reader. I've used powerfully because that's evaluative. And some examples insist that you judge the quality of a writer's craftsmanship. Powerfully does the job as an evaluative adverb there. Uh, I've said the explanation, the dashes show uh, the distress and the anxiety the narrator feels at the friendship deteriorating. Then I link to context. I've said this poem echoes Wordsworth's own concerns regarding his strained relationship with Coleridge. And I just clarify a little bit about that, about Coleridge's altered character when he came back from abroad. My main concern when I'm talking about context is that the context is relevant to the points I've been making about the poem, about the language techniques and the structural techniques. You'd be hard pushed here to argue that this was not relevant context. I'm linking Wordsworth's life and his relationships to the content of the poem. Ho oh, ho, we're on to the last lap here folks, the final furlong. Now I've done enough talking today, if you want to read through this just freeze the screen, have a good goggle. It sums up everything I've talked about in the video. And that's your lot folks. William Wordsworth's A Complaint, Done and Dusted. It only remains for me to bid you a fond farewell, as the Italians say, Arrivederci.